we're ha actually having a book launch on Thursday afternoon of this book called The Palgrave Handbook of EU-Asia Relations, which consists of um, 40 chapters and uh, 50 contributors. Um, so it was a fantastic experience. We had people from um, four continents involved in that. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about is whether the European Union um, needs a pivot towards Asia. Um, the, let's see if I can get this to work. Perfect. The US already has its pivot towards Asia, its rebalancing, whatever term um, we might need, um, talk about. And um, in a, um, and this comes from uh, Hillary Clinton's article in Foreign Affairs in October 2011, when she talked about the most important um, tasks of American statecraft over the next decade, lo being locking in a type of an investment of what basically she calls in the article smart, smart power um, in the Asia-Pacific um, region, um, while of course emphasising the important relationship with the, United, with the European Union, um, which is under a bit of discussion at the moment. And um, so what... If we have some US pivot, we also, and I'm happy to talk about this in question time, have an Australian um, pivot taking place. And I live in um, Melbourne, and um, this is the, the issue that is being discussed quite a bit in Melbourne uh, and in Australia in general. Australia has issued a uh, paper um, called Australia in the Asian Century. They do not call it the Pacific Century. That is what the Americans call it. But the, they call it the Asian Century because it doesn't... Many people talking about the Asian century don't necessarily see it as an Asia-Pacific century. Um, they depends on how you actually look at it. And the Japanese uh, perspective has been very um, challenging, particularly under Prime Minister Hatoyama in that regard. Um, so in a sense, the, uh, the decision has to be whether the European Union wishes to actually go all the way with the USA, as it were, or wish to, wishes to show itself to be an independent actor, a coherent actor, and a consistent actor. And I would put to you very strongly that the European Union is not perceived as a strong coherent or consistent actor by its Asian interlocutors, um, its Asian partners. Um, it is working very, very closely in what I call selective or opportunistic regionalism. In other words, using inter-regionalism when it works with ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, but quite often um, it's um, signing trade agreements when, for instance, the EU ASEAN one um, collapsed in 2008, mostly because of Myanmar, but not only because of that. Um, it's now signing um, uh, uh, bilateral relations, bilateral uh, uh, FTAs. The uh, Korean one is the most famous, of course, uh, the Singaporean one most recently, and a host of others. So, in a sense, the question is does the European Union really need to think about its own interests and also what those interests are and how to define them, promote them, and protect them? them in the um, Asia-Pacific context. One of the challenges straight away is the fact that the European Union is not, is not a united actor in the relationship with China, but, but not only in that relationship. Um, Germany, the UK and France dominate the relationship. National interests dominate, dominate um, the relationship um, consistently. And um, David O'Sullivan in a uh, talk he gave a few months ago suggests that the EU's value to um, the Asia Pacific region is as a rules based cooperative security um, context. Um, and I think that that perhaps is, um, I think it's optimistic. I think it's more an expression of, of hope um, rather than of achievement. And I think David knows I think that. <laughs> um, and I, th I think then we have to see basically what are the sort of pivots that the European Union um, sees as the most important ones and who should it be working with. It is partly working with Australia. Um, it's in, in the middle of a negotiation on something called a framework agreement at the moment. It already, under a previous agreement called the Partnership Framework of 2008, is working very closely on... Um, uh, support for development assistance, for instance, working together on humanitarian um, issues, and they signed an agreement on civilian crisis management in the region um, as well, similar to the one that the EU signed with um, the United States. Um, the US, however, has also become increasingly a partner of um, the European Union in the Asia-Pacific. I would suggest to you that this it brings with it its challenges. The possibilities for the European Union to be regarded as an independent actor, as a potential mediator in disputes, such as in the Aceh monitoring mission um, in Indonesia, 
Um, in these cases, I think that there is a challenge for the European Union, particularly since um, the Clinton Ashton Declaration of July last year, where they expressed their wish to be more involved in the Asia Pacific and talked about the Asia Pacific, the Asian context and the Asian partners as a sort of less than significant other, I think. I think it's a very problematic, problematic um, document. The other issue is that I think the European Union has to be present. There is a history of abstention in terms of turning up to fora in the um, Asian context, and whether it's the ASEAN Regional Forum or others, or indeed ASEAN itself, it's a question of the European Union having a coherent presence, a coherent vision and a coherent message, and it simply did not turn up. It was only in 2012 that you began to see um, Catherine Ashton turning up to meetings such as the ASEAN Regional Forum. This matters. It matters to Asian interlocutors because summitry matters just as much as symmetry for Asian interlocutors. And I think this has been a, um, a challenge to try and get that message across, that it actually does care. And cancelling meetings in Asia, as has been done by Catherine Ashton in the past, is not a very good signal to put out to people where face and showing up matters. Um, there also are some problems of both coherence and consistency in the European Union's message. Coherence and consistency in terms of whether it's a member state speaking or indeed whether it is the European Union and if so, which part of the European Union is actually talking. And I think this is a me the message from many of the surveys um, that have been conducted. Um, really the message is that uh, the European Union is not regarded as anything other than a trade actor, and even there, um, not necessarily as a trade actor for many of the Asian interlocutors. And um, I'm part of a project that is run by Maybridge Stumbaum at the University at Free University of Berlin, where we're looking at some of these Asian perceptions of um, the European Union. And I'm going to do a little bit of advertising, if I may. Excuse me. Um, Maybridge is going to be talking at this conference along with many others, and we're very happy for you to come along because. Um, Louis, Professor Louis Brennan, who is the Director of the Institute for International Integration Studies, uh, where I am also um, privileged to be a research associate. Uh, he and I are running this conference together. Please feel free to have a look at this and, and to come along to a number of sessions. Uh, we do ask that you register for catering purposes, but we'd be delighted to have you come along. So my British will be talking about some of these issues, along with the Australian Ambassador to the EU, for instance, who will give his perspective on them as well. I think that I can't talk for three hours because we've been told we'd have to send out for takeaway ice creams if that was the case. So really I'm going to give you a sort of this, what I'm giving you is a snapshot, so I'm happy to deal with issues in more um, detail afterwards. But I think this consistency issue across policy um, is a problem, and I think that, to put it very simply, trade drives diplomacy in the EU's um, negotiations and discussions. <coughs> so indeed does China, the issue of China, drive any other consideration um, in the relationship. There is an increasing self-confidence in Asia. Barry Desker um, from Singapore has argued in a piece he wrote about a week or two ago that there is a danger of smugness among many Asians who are doing extremely well. And to be careful of that, it may not actually be the Asian century. But nevertheless, there's a great deal of growth and there is a need for the European Union to <laughs> treat its interlocutors in t more in terms of symmetry and parity as partners rather than as uh, recipients of um, development assistance alone. And so the EU is, in a sense, challenged um, and to develop its priorities and indeed its values. It's done this to a certain extent by its... Um, <laughs> Uh, East Asia policy guidelines, its foreign policy guidelines, which came out in June last year. However, that's, that document, very interesting document, it's very clearly written, is really in a sense a listing of the issues that are challenges in the Asia-Pacific region and mm, taking adequate note of the important role of both um, the United States and China, rather than actually setting out a strategy. There is no Asia strategy at the moment um, in, um, uh, uh, for Asia. Um, by the European um, Union. So one of the challenges is there's no coherent strategy on the Asian side either. So so sovereignty matters. The embedded intergovernmentalism in ASEAN, the Association of, Association <coughs> of Southeast Asian Nations, for instance, means that there are differing commitments to 
um, regionalism, uh, differing commitments to something that is held dear in the European Union, to democracy and indeed um, to human rights. Um, there are very differing political orientations, as we know. Um, the European Union is very much uh, dominated by its own economic interest agenda, by the pursuit of FTAs and by its concern about the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is in some cases being referred to as um, the United States equivalent, economic equivalent of an Asia-Pacific um, NATO. Uh, so it's quite interesting that is, that is also being regarded in security terms. I mean, if it does come to pass, now that Japan is still looks like it's going to be in, and now that China is at least being discussed as a member, that, that's more problematic. 650 million people approximately um, within that MTPP. So that's also a challenge. And the challenge is um, also that Asia is crowded. It's crowded with regional entities. There isn't just one major player in town like we have in the European context, but you've got ASEAN, you've ASEAN plus three, you've got APEC, which stands for the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, though there are some people in Australia who refer to it as a perfect excuse to chat. Um, and so what you have is a very much a crowded agenda and then of course a crowded set of hegemons. You've got China, the regional hegemon, and or aspiring to regional hegemon depending on which perspective you take, and you've got the United States, the external hegemon which has its own pivot um, and which is has its um, seventh fleet which of course the um, European Union doesn't have. So this whole challenge of how much autonomy to take from the, um, from the US strategy is also a problem. One of the ways of looking at it is to reimagine security in terms of non-traditional security for the European Union to work on what it's really good at, and that is non-traditional security, capacity building, disaster management, civilian crisis management, um, mediation, um, these sort of issues. And here we see also the discussion of the European Union as a type of norms entrepreneur. It sees itself as a promoter of regionalism, of values, and um, a promoter of good governance. Um, and this is, again, very problematic. And we've actually got a session on it at our um, symposium on Thursday and Friday, looking at these issues. Um, we've asked the person in charge of this regionalism promotion to come and come over from the Commission to talk about it. So we're delighted about that. So the EU, in a sense, is dealing with rapidly changes, changing issues with the tectonic changes that are taking place in terms of security, with the fact that economic regionalism matters in Asia in so many different ways, but that, re that security regionalism is the problematic aspect in many ways. And it's what um, uh, Bill Tao calls a web of alliances, of security alliances. And of course, you've got this hub and spokes approach of the United States towards its interlocutors. Now, the European Union can develop its relations with its four strategic partners in the region, um, China, uh, Korea, Japan, and India. And one of the ways it can do this is by actually developing a strategic partnership in, uh, with ASEAN. Now, what exactly is a strategic partnership? Well, we could spend a few years on that one, but one person um, has been quoted in the European Union as saying, it's a bit like love you recognize it when you experience it. Uh, I'm not so sure that that's tremendously um, useful for us, but really, in a sense, the strategic framework and context for the European um, Union in terms of its Asia strategy started actually in trying to develop one in 2001, following on, on from a, a very much a trade and human rights oriented one in 19. Uh, 94. But what we begin to see is China's year, in, Europe's year in Asia is the term that was used by the European External Action Service um, for its achievements. When Catherine Ashton attended the ASEAN Regional Forum, when Catherine Ashton signed the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation um, with ASEAN, um, when, it, when the um, EU developed its East, East Asia Foreign Policy Guidelines, there, and when you also had the signature of this um, transatlantic agreement on the Asia Pacific. But in a sense, there's still a danger, I think, of the European Union being crowded out in this rather crowded Asia uh, regionalism um, context. So um, David O'Sullivan has said, look, what we're doing is we're working on our three Ds, defence, diplomacy and development, and I've come up with three Ps um, in response to that, and that is presence. 
You have to have presence. It matters whether you turn up and who turns up. Credibility matters by actually being there. You have to show, I think, a sense of partnership, strategic or otherwise. It doesn't matter whether it's called a reliable partnership or whatever. That's terminology that can be fixed up by the relevant people. It's got to be a partnership rather than a donor-recipient relationship or a China-focused relationship only. And um, so that partnership is tremendously important. And I think that is what is needed is a pivot which doesn't only focus on security because there is no um, seventh um, fleet, um, because the ASEAN Regional Forum is where Catherine Ashton and others are increasingly called upon to, to take part. And because the East Asia Summit is the summit where Russia attends where the United States attends, where all the major East Asian actors attend, and where Europe and Australia and um, India and uh, New Zealand and others, but the EU is not a member. And the EU has not been accorded membership, despite quite a bit of diplomatic um, work in this regard. And I think this is partly because presence matters. Um, summary um, does matter. So I'm going to finish by suggesting to you that there is a triple hierarchy problem. There is a hierarchy of, of policies, and this is actually ha on, true for both sides, where trade drives diplomacy, except in the case of the Asian side, security is up there as a co-equal. Um, the second issue is a hierarchy of interlocutors, where China is the major concern um, in terms of trade, um, in particular. And the third is the hierarchy of national interests and indeed the dominance of national interests um, in the European Union strategy um, towards Asia. And that is why there are so many tensions, for instance, in the context of the arms embargo in terms of um, trade access. And this is um, a, a significant challenge for the European Union to be seen to be um, speaking um, with one voice. I think that the problem really is that the European Union needs a strategy coherence or a pivot coherence, a coherence of policy, of personality and of tasks. And at the moment, the European Union is in danger of um, being a follower rather than a leader um, in the Asian context. Thank you. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you.